I was wondering if God thought you were taking the short bus. Hello, and welcome yet again to another edition of What's Good About It. Well, judging from Jerry Goldsmith's Star Trek score there, well, it looks like we're in for... a movie that I like to consider the bane of my existence sometimes. Yep, Star Trek V The Final Frontier. You see that V right there on the video cover? Yeah. That V isn't really the Roman numeral for five. That V stands for Vanity Project. Yes, this movie was a love letter from Bill from William Shatner to his character, Captain James Tiberius Kirk. I'm not kidding. It really was. This thing is a colossal vanity project. A train wreck of a movie, to be sure. And is also, like I said, the bane of my existence. But somehow it's actually kind of a guilty pleasure. At least to me, anyway. I don't know how other people feel about it. But here I'm going to try and talk about what is actually good about Star Trek V, The, Vo the Final Frontier. Yeah. This music score is pretty nice. Maybe that's about it, really. <laughs> this will be a short review, I'm sure. I guess about the only really good thing I could say about this movie is, well, the music score by Jerry Goldsmith. That's about it, really. Otherwise, there really isn't much to say about this movie. You don't have to agree with my opinions. I mean, after all, that's what makes us all great. We're all free to debate and disagree. So if you like this film, if it brings you joy, or even if it's just a serious guilty pleasure, hey, good for you. No one can deprive you of that. Although there's nothing really wrong with disagreeing with agreeing with others that dog shit isn't very tasty, right? Goldsmith's score works pretty effectively here. I mean, he does a good job, actually. It's just a pity he had to give score to this movie. And of course we got the pretty lights and everything. Hey, <laughs> pretty, put it in the movie! But enough about that. Let's talk more about Goldsmith's score. This score is called A Busy Man, and yeah, this is one of Jerry Goldsmith's best works. It's a pity it has to be wasted in this movie. But other than that, I would say this is very good. And it has the same slow pace of the motion picture. But that's okay, at least we can enjoy the score here. <laughs> I've heard of God as my pilot before. I've heard of God as my co-pilot before, but never really meant quite literally. Well, welcome to Planet Soundstage. Swear the comic book adaptation made this place look better. Originally, this was supposed to be shot on location, probably in some lush jungle or forest or whatever. Instead, it's shot here on this barren sand heap that's really just a soundstage. And I think the reason for that is, well, because shooting on location costs money. That's expensive. So, therefore, Vision has to take a backseat to budget. In any case, even if the visuals had been there, a weak script cannot translate into a strong movie. So, basically, this film has a lot of comedy in it, which is probably the big problem here. You can't have broad comedy in the search for God. I don't see how that would work. The deep philosophical humor in the search for God in this movie just doesn't really mix very well with the slapstick comedy that's in place here. I mean, we've gone from the ultimate search for God and ultimate knowledge and wisdom to the Three Stooges. I suppose the campfire scene was alright, although you got a lot of those ridiculous marshmallow gags and also the bourbon and beer joke and the bourbon and beans jokes. Yeah, which basically means that, right, three movies ago, we were basically talking about a genetically enhanced Superman who quoted Sh who quoted Melville, and now we're only an inch or two away from pull my finger jokes. Singing row row your boat. Good night, Pa. Good night, Ma. 
And that's what you get for eating for eating marshmallows, for toasting marshmallows, singing and farting the night away. Well, we do get this gag. Must be the beans. That's what you get for betraying me, bastard. Oh, well, at least we get a little fun here from Shatner shouting. Any minute now. Yeah, that's good. But of course, Spock doesn't do it. No, Aristotle proved that the, the world was round, and aristocracies basically measured the earth. Columbus basically was the one who discovered America, uh, that is, making Europe aware of its existence. Oh yeah, I'd like to interject just really quickly. Star Trek is actually rhymed with train wreck, <laughs> and that's what this movie is, a train wreck. Continue. Sounds like Shatner after watching the premiere. Well, the fact that Shatner's guilty here of... Well, let's see, the fact that Cybok is guilty of having a large ego, coming from Shatner, that's just beyond ironic. So everybody's supposed to mutiny against Kirk here, including Spock and McCoy. However, since Kirk had sacrificed his future in Starfleet to rescue Spock from the Genesis planet, well, Nimoy refused to go along with that, and so did DeForest Kelly. Yep, which only shows just how out of step Sulu's behavior is here in this movie, since he was also willing to go along to send him, was willing to go along to the Genesis planet to save Spock as well. And apparently Shatner can, and Shatner thought it would be a good idea for all of them to betray him. Yeah, sure. Cybok can just undo all that loyalty with one Smith therapy session. Please. That only just illustrates why it's better to pretend that there was no Star Trek V. Going from 4 to 6 without 5 just flows naturally. That's how much of a misstep this movie was. Dangerous free soloing. David Lowry's involvement in the film. A code that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why not hostage hey El pay? Doesn't that make a little more sense? Oh well, despite of these pro despite all these problems, I don't know. Star Trek V is a serious guilty pleasure for many, maybe even myself included. Revelations that don't really go anywhere and are never explained again after this movie. Yep. Yeah. So we get a lot of really bad slapstick comedy. An Enterprise that's about as big as a frickin' skyscraper with extra numbers on it. Spock is jetting down instead of up, in spite of the fact that he grabbed the gravity boots to actually go up. Maybe. Scotty and Uhura develop a relationship that comes out of nowhere, never spoken about before this movie, and will never be spoken about ever again. A god who looks like Santa Claus. A villain who's only doing what he's doing because he's flippin' bored. He has no motivations at all. A weak drawing of God that sounds like Yosemite Sam. Ooh, I hate that rabbit! Nearly a little man-on-man -man action. That, in a nutshell, is Star Trek V The Final Frontier. How does this movie hold up? It doesn't. I mean, it really doesn't. It's no wonder that this was the lowest grossing Star Trek movie, and to this day continues to be the film that, well, was considered the weak link in the Trek chain. But then again, there are plenty worse movies for Star Trek. <laughs> Nemesis comes immediately to mind. Yeah, actually, now that I think about that, yeah, Jerry Goldsmith did the music score for that one, too. Ah, it sucks to be him. Anyway, that was Star Trek V. Well, there you have it. What was good about Star Trek V, The Final Frontier? I told you this probably wouldn't take very long. I mean, yeah, 
there's a lot wrong with this movie. The only good thing I can possibly say for it is Jerry Goldsmith's music score. It's a real shame that there's only one Star Trek movie that he scored that didn't suck. And that was First Contact. <laughs> what are the odds? Well, anyway, I shall see you next time. Live long and prosper. Promise. It's funny that Lieutenant Dan said that, because just then, God showed up.